The title of our message today is The Light Shines in the Darkness. The Light Shines in the Darkness. I'd like to invite you to open your Bible or keep it open there to John chapter 1. This isn't going to be complicated. There's three verses in John chapter 1 that uh, we're going to particularly give thought to as we share together. First of all, verse 5, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Verse 10, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And then verse 14, all from chapter 1 here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We look out into our world and we want to be hopeful, hopeful for a better future. We're thinking of our kids, grandkids, and probably of ourselves, too. What do you think is ahead for us? A higher standard of living? Better careers? Maybe easier financial times are just ahead? More peace on Earth? Or maybe it's more likely there'd be more drone strikes? And what about the dominant philosophies? We could start with uh, evolution. But there's not too much hope in evolution. Or maybe in postmodernism. But the latest news on that front is that there is not and cannot be such a thing as truth. Truth is what's truth to you. That's all. Really, they're just saying there's no such thing as truth. We're all just little islands of biology, destined to be born and eventually to die, drop back into the ground and become fertilizer so that skunk cabbage can grow. There's not a lot of hope there. It came out uh, not too long ago that uh, even the shortest trip to Mars that astronauts could, could manage would expose them to an enormous dose of radiation on the way. So even to colonize that, uh, that minimally atmosphered planet may be much more difficult than we'd thought. So that means what? We're stuck here then. We're trapped on this tiny, violent globe with no real past, nothing to hope for today, and no real future. So that's one uh, approach. But there is other news. John 1, verse 5, the Bible says that what? The light shines in the darkness. Uh, let's work on that darkness idea. Almost everything we've said so far is about darkness. What we have out there on every side is darkness, and that's why there's so little hope. That's why science tells us that we are not made of the image of God, but we are, we are a meaningless biological accident. Humanity is a strange anomaly, evolved from a lifeless, odiferous soup. That's why philosophy tells us, don't bother to look for truth. It either isn't accessible or it just isn't even there. There is no truth, just whatever we want it to be, whatever we might think it would be. Certain ways of thinking, what do they do? They turn off the lights, and what seems to surround us is an absence of light on every side. And yet the Bible tells us, that the light shines in the darkness. It looks to us as though all is unlighted. It looks like everything is dark, but there's something that is not darkness. Where is light? There's light. Where is it? Well, light is everywhere, even in the darkness. There are things that we cannot know just by looking at the natural world. There are things that we cannot know in any way except if there is a creator and that the creator chooses to simply give them to us. We cannot know unless he hands them to us on a silver platter. 
That's to say that unless the light shines in the darkness, there's a lot of things we're not going to know. What we're talking about here is revealed religion. Things that we have no way of knowing unless God shows them to us. And so, he gave. Unselfishly, he gave. He gave his only son. He gave life. He gave forgiveness. He gave hope. He gave promise. He gave revelation, and he revealed his word through the prophets. The light was shining in the darkness. But the brightest shining, he saved for about 2,000 years ago. Then, the three persons, God the Father... Son and Holy Spirit sent the Son, Jesus. The infinite God became the, became the limited man. Jesus entered the human experience. The light shone in the darkness. Jesus lived and taught and told the truth into a world that then, as now, had no use for it. Darkness reigned and, and had no interest in light. Light was unwelcome. But the light came, and Jesus was there, and Jesus shined in the darkness. And the darkness did not understand it, refused to understand it. Therefore, it could not understand it. In John chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know him. That's pretty amazing stuff. Your own creator you do not know. The Bible, speaking of Jesus, says that he was in the world. But the world didn't know him. What is more ironic than that? Jesus was in the world. He knew it well. He knew it inside out, you might say. Why? Because... He was its author, its creator. He came into the world, this world. Originally, when he had made the world, all had been light. But he made angelic beings, and he gave free will to them. And one, his name in the Hebrew is Halal. We get the word hallelujah from it. But one, his name was Halal. In Latin, they called him Lucifer, Satan. Satan chose to go another way. He, a mere creature, chose to rebel against God and against God's order. Now, this was seemingly insane, right? Can a creature rebel against its creator? God hadn't made Lucifer. He had made a pure being. The pure being, though, had chosen to follow its own will. He rebelled and sought to substitute his own order in place of God's order. And that is how the darkness came to be. Wherever the creator had created, the rebel sought to uncreate, to paint over, to change the representation on creation's canvas. We can think of it as a kind of graffiti. What was light, he painted dark. Wherever God was represented, he modified the representation. Well, then you ask, did God allow this? He did, because God doesn't make robots and God doesn't make junk. When God gave free will, he knew what he was doing. He knew such things could indeed and would eventuate that they would happen, and he gave them anyway. Because the Bible says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's James chapter 1, if you want to look at it today. James chapter 1. So he gave and he did not take back. He gave freedom and some angels abused that freedom, and he cast them down to earth to be their prison house. And here's where God's newest creation was coming into being, right here on earth. God was creating a new kind, a new order of creature. This kind of creature was called a human. Humans were made in God's image, designed to reflect in a limited way, his glory into this world. Satan just hated that. Couldn't stand it. I wonder if demons turn purple with rage. I don't know what color they turn, but Satan hated it. And so with every means at his disposal, he began to misrepresent God. And God 
temporarily allowed it. It's interesting. The God of heaven really doesn't do censorship. He just allows the devils to say crazy stuff, teach crazy stuff. When I was in grade school, I was taught evolution, just as probably most of you were. God didn't intervene. He didn't send an angel into the classroom to shine up in the front of the room and say, hold on, everybody. Actually, this was created and evolution's a big fat lie. God didn't do that. God didn't censor even the devil. Instead, we heard this nonsense, but you know what? Before the nonsense ever came, God had given you his word. So the truth was out there from the get-go. And so God didn't make Lucifer, but he rebelled and chose to become what he be chose to become. Now, when God gave free will, he knew what he was doing. So he didn't take it back. He gave freedom, and some angels abused the freedom. And so here they come, because earth is where they hang out. Well, you know, what would have happened if God had intervened? What if God began censoring the angels? What if he began to cancel them uh, without giving free opportunity for, you know, different viewpoints to come along? Well, you know that a residual fear would have remained in the angel population. A, resi a residual concern would still exist that, you know, maybe there was something to those claims that God is unfair. So God didn't prevent it. God allowed them to make those claims. So it was a contest now between darkness, misrepresentation, and light, truth, the way things actually are. There was a contest between truth and error. The contest was on, the game was on. Time would tell the answer. Would the creator care for a rebel creation, or would he nuke the place? Would he burn it? As the executor of justice, or would he give himself to die for it? Would he cast thunderbolts at sinners? Or would he take a human body like yours and mine and stretch forth his hands and receive the cold, hard steel of spikes driven through those hands by his own creatures? Would he do that? The darkness tried to blot him out. The graffiti tried to override everything. But you know what? The light shone in the darkness. There was and is something that actually mattered and actually matters. It is what and who God is. John, 1 John 4, verse, 1, verse 16 says just three little words to us. God is love. We are are not love. God is love. He is the source. We are merely illuminable creatures. We can shine, but only with his light. We have no light of our own. He is the source of light. We are its absence. Human beings can shine, but they need to be connected to the source. I don't know if you've noticed in this church building, but um, one day I was counting these. I think there was 77 or so lights I counted in this room. This is a, a kind of a unique sanctuary. It is very much a place of light. And I'm sure that was in the, in the mind when you guys put this all together and built it. Uh, but it's interesting. There's an illustration right here of God is shining his light. Now... We usually think of that light as God because God is also light. He's represented as light. But we might also think of the, the illustration, too, if the lights were off. We won't turn them off just now, but if, if they were all turned off, that's more representing you and me. We can shine, but it has to be that God would give us life. On our own, we, are, uh, we don't shine at all all. But God is light, and the light shines in the darkness. We are darkness. He is light. And so he wants to shine. He's love. We're not love, but we need to be connected to the source. Now, the world today rejects the idea that there is light. 
It rejects a belief that there can be a source. It sees and it sees and only sees darkness. There is no room in its dark universe for a hand that would voluntarily be nailed through and die bearing the curse for lost rebels. That isn't there anywhere. John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, though, about that hand. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So now in this book, his revealed truth, this, this flashlight that tells us what God's truth is, that's where it's recorded. The event of all ages, the most spectacular event there ever was or ever will be, it's written in the pages that God gave you that is in your Bible. And this is the truth. This is the life that Jesus, the Word, became flesh. He entered into his creation. The Creator stepped into the created frame. The Word became flesh, human flesh, our flesh. And he pitched his tent. That's what the Greek says. He skenade. He pitched his tent right here in camp with us. He came to dwell with us. He came to the city of rebels. Who's, for those whose sins effective, effectively had pierced him through, those whose sins he freely, voluntarily took, and he who received our punishment in our place and died for us, Jesus came and did that for us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The light shines in the darkness. Jesus dwelt among us and he hung on the cross that was the light that blasts into every crack and every crevice. The light that takes away the graffiti, the laser that erases the tattoos, the brightness that comes to the darkness and shows us a different path in his life and on his cross. We see him. He is the source of grace and truth. He is full of grace and truth. He is Christ. The world is Antichrist because the world is darkness. But let's Let's boil all of this down. People are looking today for something that matters. But not all people. Some people have sold out. They've accepted the darkness. They decided that instead of camping in it, they're going to live in it. They're just going to be, you know, go ahead and let it soak all the way in. They've accepted that story, the story that they will live and get aches and pains, and die, and become fish food, and that nothing that they've done, or can do, or will do, will ever matter. Some people have accepted that. The world is not broken because there's nothing to fix. In their viewpoint, all that's removed. They're just, there is no Jesus, and there is no light. There's no hope. All there is, is the moment. You know, put some salt on it and eat it. That's all there is. Some people will end thinking that way, but no one starts thinking that way. Isn't that interesting? Because the why? Because the light shines in the darkness. Because when you were created, God gave you in your humanity, part of the humanity, he gave you a conscience. His Holy Spirit came to work on you and in you. And all through time, we have at different times been more and sometimes very much less responsive to God and the conscience he gave us. But he didn't leave us in the darkness. He didn't start us in the darkness. And you know what? The fact is that none of us need to die in the darkness. God is holding out a light. The light is shining in the darkness. And even in our advanced age of 2021, the light shining in the darkness. And so the Bible teaches us, if we save our life, we lose it. If we lose our life, we save it. If we adopt the code of darkness, 
We close out the light, but it is still out there. Everything that is of this world is of this world. It is temporary. It is transient. It is of the darkness. It is limited. It's not going anywhere. But Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus is a person, a person in many respects like yourself. Jesus not only thinks, he feels. He has a hatred of evil. And he's glad when he sees mercy. He cannot be fooled because he knows what is in us. He has come into that darkness. The word became flesh. He came into hopelessness and brought hope. He is the true light who lights every person who comes into this world. Every breath you take, you're not entitled to it. It is a gift from him. Every breath. You, are, you can be connected to him. Every beating of your heart is a gift from him. Every smiling child, every appreciation for purity, every hatred for evil, every hatred for injustice, for sin, for suffering, all of that comes to us as a gift from him. Blueberries are a gift from him. He, had he not made you, there'd be no you. No lesser light would be able to shine. And so I commend to you today, in conclusion, I told you this would be real simple. I commend to you today Jesus. He is the light that shines in your darkness. But you are the one who chooses. You can be connected to him, connected to something, the only thing that matters. You can be one small avenue in this world for the love of God, of this God to shine in this dark world. And that's, that is God's plan for each one of us. Or you can just hang back in the darkness, fearing the light, cowering in fear of the reality that will so very soon burst into brightness when this Jesus who is shining in the darkness will come. The Bible tells us, first, uh, rather, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, he comes in flaming fire. And he's going to come in flaming fire and erase the graffiti. And he's going to love and heal his wounded children. None need stand tattered in the darkness, but all... You too can come to Jesus. The wool has been pulled over your eyes, but it is given you to remove it in the power of Jesus. Jesus, who has destroyed the grave and death, and whose physical return, I believe, is very near. I don't know about you, but the last two years have convinced me uh, that his return is perhaps much nearer and I had thought of it as, as before that time. I don't know about you. But the rate of change in our world seems to have sharply increased. Darkness is almost full grown. But Jesus is countering that darkness, growing children of light. And he has called all of us to his kingdom of light for just such a time, I believe, as this.